Hello, fellow Rebel Capitalists. Hope you're well. Coming to you today from St. Bart's. And we got Josh right out there. Still in the heat. <laughs> Still toiling away at YouTube stuff. But he's on this live stream editing for us, going back and forth from article to article, chart to chart. We work in the news. Most of you heard that it went bust today, filed for bankruptcy. But that's just the tip of the story or the tip of the iceberg excuse me i think that's where the story begins and there's all this contagion risk not just within commercial real estate but within the banking system that nobody is talking about and i think that's the much bigger story let's get right into this article from cnbc and you guys will understand exactly what i'm referring to title we work has massive footprint in london its bankruptcy could shake up the city's office market. Now, I want you to also use New York City interchangeably with London. And I know the bankruptcy right now only applies to the United States and Canada. We talked about that on the last video that I did. But I think this is pretty much a foregone conclusion. And I was talking about that. I see WeWork everywhere, even in Colombia and Medellin. They have these massive buildings. Well, obviously, they're, they're leasing these massive buildings. And I know a lot of the digital the digital nomads and entrepreneurs and the real estate guys in many, and I don't know any of them that, uh, that use WeWork. That's just anecdotal evidence. But my point is if they're really struggling in the United States and Canada, I would assume that they're gonna be struggling in a lot of different markets across the entire globe. And it's not just WeWork. If they go bust, they don't go bust in a vacuum right? Let's look at how much space they were occupying or leasing just in London. We go to this fourth talking point. According to CoStar, WeWork had 36 offices in London, in London spanning more than 2.89 million square feet. But let's remember, guys, that real estate, the prices are really set at the margins. So whatever these big office buildings are selling for, those are going to be the comps for the rest of the office buildings. It's just like residential, right? And when you have 3 million square feet just coming right up on the market very soon, I don't see how that doesn't impact occupancy rates. And if that drops occupancy rates overall, then that's going to impact the valuations of those properties. And therefore, if they're selling, which I don't, you know, along with what's going on in the banking system, I don't know how they're rolling over that debt. I'm, they, meaning the people that own these buildings, when their main tenant, WeWork, bails on the lease. And now all of a sudden, you know, they were at 80% occupancy. They go down to 30% occupancy. Even if they can roll over their debt, how are they going to make those payments? And rolling over that debt will most likely be at a much higher interest rate. And there's probably going to be... a um, it, not just because rates went up, but because there's a risk premium attached to it. And they're going to try to offload the property. Most of them are going to be underwater. And you can see how this can turn into a very big problem very, very quickly. What happened is it's almost like commercial real estate in these big cities put all their eggs in one basket. It's like having a business where you only have two or three customers. Okay, well... If one of those customers bails on you, you're, you're, you're done, right? You could be bust as a result. And it's very similar to the liability side of Silicon Valley Bank's balance sheet as well. Remember, the, you looked at the difference between their depositors and something like Bank of America, where Bank of America, it's right at the top of my head, I believe that 70% plus of their deposits are in accounts that are under the FDIC limit. 250,000. In the banking world, the language they use to describe that is very sticky accounts. It's very unlikely that those people move from Bank of America to Wells Fargo to another regional bank, uh, even if there's troubles in the banking system, because they're almost all under that FDIC limit, where you compare that to Silicon Valley Bank, and they had very few depositors relative to a B of A. And 95%, and I'm just throwing that number out there as an example, 
but the good majority of their depositors were well north of 250,000. So that was the opposite of sticky deposits. So they had all their eggs in one basket. So if that tech basket, which is what most of their depositors depended upon, if that crashed, then the bank goes down with it. So my whole point is that's very similar to the commercial real estate in these huge cities where WeWork comes in. And let's just take it to an extreme so we can get our head around it. Let's say they lease 50% of the available space. So now all these landlords are like, wow, this is fantastic. This WeWork client, we're going to go ahead and out of all the available space, they're going to take a bigger percentage of that overall pie. But that's doing the exact same thing that Silicon Valley Bank did to where you have fewer and fewer and fewer customers. Therefore, if one of those customers goes uh, bust, it's going to severely impact your business, your bank, where if you had, let's just say a million customers and one of them goes bust, it isn't going to be that big of a deal. This is really the first part of the contagion risk that we might see play out in commercial real estate that's already been beaten to a pulp anyway, and it's already on its on its last leg, but this could be kind of the catalyst that tips it over the edge. But it's not just that, and it's not just about the banking system. There's something else that I wanna talk about. There's something else, there's more contagion risk that is outside of WeWork, commercial real estate, and the overall banking system. Let's go over to that right now. Here's a story from Fast Company. This is a couple, a few months old here, but you get the gist. And I didn't even know this Adam Newman character was doing anything. I, I thought that he kind of cashed out and was setting off into the sunset. Apparently not. So going back, I think it was 2019, something like that, WeWork was supposed to go public. And just before they went public, their... Uh, their financials came out, something like that. And the Wall Street looked at their financials and said, what, this is a joke. You can't take this company public. And the reason why they were the talk of the town is because of this charismatic CEO named Adam Newman. And he was talking about how this was disrupting commercial or the office space. And they always use, they try to make these old school businesses look new and modern. And they try to throw some tech spin on it. When in reality, it's just the old school business of co-working or executive suites, executive offices that have been a thing for decades and decades and decades. It's when you go in there and you just lease uh, a bunch of space at a certain price and you sublease it at a higher price. It's it's not rocket science, but this Adam Newman character made it seem like he was revolutionizing the business just because he used all these buzzwords and he would kind of make it seem vague, but he's a very good salesman, good enough to make you know hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, while his company was incinerating cash. So now let's fast forward to what Mr. Adam Newman is doing in 2023. And this, I think, is almost as big of a risk as the contagion risk that WeWork has with commercial real estate, therefore the banking system. Let me explain. So Adam Newman has now been funded by Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the biggest, what you want to call them, angel investors in Silicon Valley. And they've raised, I'm skipping down the article here, they've raised about $350 million. $350 million right here. And, and he started a new company, he, Adam Newman, called Flow. You say, well, what is Flow? And basically what he's doing is, I would argue this is as close to a scam. It's legal, but man, it sure... I think there's some gray area here when you see what he did with WeWork. He took an old school business model and tried to make it seem like it was disrupting this uh, this industry. And he did it just through pure salesmanship. And I guess that's not technically illegal, but like I said, I think there's some massive gray area there. And now what's happening is they're giving him basically $350 million to do it again. The exact same thing. Basically, he's in the business of duping investors. 
He's in the business. It, it's it's almost like a financial snake oil salesman, where they they've got something that you know just might be uh, aspirin mixed with water or something like that, right? But they're selling it as this 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 cure all. And now he's got something just basically residential real estate, multifamily, and he's selling it as something that's going to completely take over the world. This is like nothing you've ever seen before. When if you just scratch beneath the surface, you're like, wait a minute, isn't that just an apartment complex? Oh, no, 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 no. An apartment complex. How dare you? How dare you, sir? This is not an apartment complex. This is a communal living space where people are building the future. This is not an apartment complex. This is flow. Oh, my goodness gracious, in that case. Yeah, because if that was just an apartment complex, I'd only be willing to pay $10 million for it. But if it is the communal living space of the future, if it's flow, well then, oh my gosh, it's gotta be worth $10 billion. As I say it out loud, it sounds funny. It sounds ridiculous. As though investors, there's no way but that they could be duped by this again. But Andreessen Horowitz is putting $350 million betting that Newman can do it again. If he did it with office space, they're betting he can pull the wool over the investor's eyes with residential, just but to a greater degree. And behind the closed doors, they have to know that this is just nonsense. But they're just betting that they can find a greater fool or many, many greater fools again and cash out and just let someone else hold the bag. It's just, it's unbelievable. And if investors continue to be duped by this through FOMO or YOLO or whatever it is or chasing yield, this, I think, has almost as much contagion risk as what we're talking about with the banking system, commercial real estate, and them putting all their baskets or all their eggs in one basket by having very few tenants and just going straight for that we work, quote unquote, free money. Let's get on to how Newman des describes this new residential real estate play that he, I'm sure he's calling a tech business. Uh, and he says it's going to, there's a quote, disrupt the world's largest asset class by introducing a model that purportedly combined the best parts of apartment renting and home ownership. So you say, hmm, he's combining home ownership with apartment renting. So what's great about apartment renting is, uh, you know, you can just up and move. You don't have that much of a commitment. But the great thing about home ownership is you're building equity. So you're thinking to yourself initially, well, maybe he's doing something where he's like, I don't know, selling shares of or giving shares of an entity away for his renters or something. I don't know, giving them some sort of equity position. Not really. I mean, he never really gets into it. But what he kind of insinuates is that they're not going to really be homeowners, but they're going to have the feeling of being a homeowner. <laughs> and you're like, what? And then you just start to see through the BS. And it's like... He's just the snake oil salesman, guys. It's just three or four years ago, he was selling a different snake oil. But he's using the exact same tricks. And it seems like, at least the invest, the initial investors, are buying into it again. And maybe it's just the business model of a greater fool. And they realize that he's a great front man because he can sell the snake oil because he's a proven commodity. He's done it in the past. Even though his business incinerated cash, I guess the first few people that got in, like a pyramid scheme, actually did well, or like a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme. So Fast Company is talking about how Newman was talking. I guess he did some sort of event like live conference uh, that he was a part of a few months ago where he talked nonstop for almost an hour. But what Fast Company says is although he talked about this new company flow for an hour, they still really couldn't figure out what it was. And it reminds me, it's like Klaus Schwab. He does the exact same thing. He can sit there and talk for a half hour and he's saying words, but he's not saying anything. You're just sitting there scratching your head saying, oh, hmm. 
yeah um that sounds nice yeah 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 stakeholder capitalism boy that sure sounds nice doesn't it and equity and inclusion and all these things but what give me some concrete examples oh we, we can't do that we can't do that and it's like newman is cut from the exact same cloth so here's some quotes he says that he wants through flow uh, they have this magic formula. I'm, I'm actually reading this, guys. I'm not making this up. So flow has a magic formula that is going to elevate the experience of renting an apartment by using things like community and offer tenants perceived value, perceived value that appreciates over time. Huh? What? <laughs> Either you have equity that appreciates over the time. Look, I have equity in real estate in Medellin, and there, there's no perceived appreciation. <laughs> perceived, what? What are you? There's actual appreciation. It isn't just something that's in my head. Maybe he wants to sell shares in the metaverse or something like that. And oh yeah, you have ownership. Oh yeah, you really? How much can I sell my shares for? Well, you can sell it for a billion dollars in the metaverse. Oh, well, what can I buy with a billion dollars in the metaverse? Oh, you can buy tons of stuff. Really? Like, like a Ferrari. Really? Yeah. Well, it's a Ferrari in the metaverse, but sure. You can still buy that. It's like, this is how insane the world has become, but we're not done yet. Newman says renters can expect one unique experience from flow. When he turned the topic, of how he would instill the sense of community and ownership, he said a very funny example. Now, this is a quote from him, guys. Keep in mind, this guy just basically duped people out of hundreds of millions of dollars by, by convincing them that this old school model had all these new bells and whistles. But at the end of the day, it was just an old school model and all those bells and whistles incinerating incinerated cash. So this is his MO, right? And here's what he says about his new venture, Flow, that is going to revolutionize the largest asset class in the world, that being real estate, residential real estate, is if you're in your apartment building and you're a renter and your toilet gets clogged, you call the super. If you're in your own apartment and you bought and you own it, your toilet gets clogged, you take the plunger. He add, and this is, um, I, I'm reading a quote from what this guy said when asked this question at a local, at a recent conference. He added, making plunging gestures in the air. It's like the difference from feeling like you own something to just feeling like you are renting. So what he's pitching is that he's just going to take your average standard apartment complex that would be worth, let's say, a million dollars. But because he's going to somehow dupe renters into feel, he's not going to give them ownership. He's just going to somehow make them feel like they own it. And therefore, that $1 million apartment complex is going to be worth a billion dollars. Revolutionary. Just give me $350 million and give me a... a an, or what will most likely turn into a billion dollars while he incinerates cash. And then he's just going to do the exact same thing. He's going to check out. He's going to hand the baton to someone else and just let them hold the bag. And he's going to fly off the St. Bart's <laughs> and he's going to get, I mean, it's just how many times does he have to do this before people get it? And if he's doing it, how many other people like him on wall street are doing the exact same thing and playing this game of the greater fool musical chairs or the greater fool Ponzi scheme. And when you think about the U.S. economy being dependent upon asset prices, and these asset prices are dependent upon this game of musical chairs. That's really what I'm getting at here, guys. So Newman did outline, he, the, the article says, because the article is kind of ripping on him, for being so vague, but they said, to be fair, he did outline four pillars of the flow business model, technology first, property management. And you guys know that when I first got into investing, it was in real estate. So I get the property management game. I get it real, real well. 
And one of my best buddies is Jason Hartman, who has been one of the most, uh, one of the pros in residential real estate for a long time. And Kenny McElroy, who's just as good as it gets when it comes to multifamily. I mean, he is as legit as they come. And I can, and I have been involved with property management companies over and over and over again with my own properties. And I cannot even tell you how many times I've had a property management company pitch me on how they're using technology to revolutionize the property management business. And every single time I just politely say bullshit, you're not, because this is not about technology. This is about plungers. This is about toilets. And this is about micromanaging people. It has nothing to do with technology. And you can layer over as much tech as you want. And at the end of the day, it's not going to do anything. Been there, done that, my friend. But is so this is just, again, he's trying to attach these fancy words onto an old school business that you really can't improve upon. Because at the end of the day, it's just managing people. Number two, a real estate asset management company that owns the buildings. Oh, because that's revolutionary. <laughs> I mean, what? Huh? Yeah. So, I mean, Kenny McElroy has been doing this for 30 years, my friend. A financial services company. Okay. I mean, that's, I guess, kind of interesting. What are you going to do? Give loans to your... It, what he's probably going to pitch is that he's going to give like buy now, pay later loans to his tenants. And he's got kind of a... a the, at the top of the funnel just with his tenants or something like that. Who knows? But here is when he completely derails the number four. This mechanism that's going to take some of the value and share it with the value of the creators. So here when I read this, I thought, okay, well, maybe he's he is actually distributing equity somehow, maybe shares of the company. But as we go down the article, we see that that's not true. What he's doing is he's giving them value through giving them the feeling of having ownership. And again, complete nonsense. So the main takeaway here, guys, is that we, when we're looking at these cycles, we need to ask ourselves, are we closer to the top or closer to the bottom? And as long as we see the Adam Newmans continuing with this ruse over and over and over again, you know that we're still closer to the top than we are the bottom. Because if we are at the bottom, for, for those of you who lived through the GFC, through 2009, we had no Adam Newmans. None, zero, nada, nilch. Now we had some in 2006, 2007, but in 2008, 2009, they all got wiped out and we went back to basics. Everyone went back to fundamentals. They mattered. All the financial engineers, they went bust. They were called the banking system, <laughs> right? And so as long as we have all these people like Chamath coming out with their SPACs, and as long as we have all of this wild speculation, as long as we have Adam Newman's out there that are able to raise $350 million, I can promise you we are closer to the top than we are to the bottom. Because when we get to that bottom point, you're not going to hear anything from the Adam Newman types because investors will want nothing to do with them. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. If you want to see more, of the most important recent stories we've done right here on this channel. Josh, we'll put them in a playlist uh, right about there, and we'll see you in the next video.